Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to tell you about our sponsor, which is the Great Courses Plus. This is what it looks like. It's an app on your phone right there. And uh, this is the teaching company, uh, the Great Courses that I've been a fan of and consumer of for uh, uh, many years. And uh, before you had to, um, you know, go online and purchase a course and take the entire course, and that's all you got. Uh, now with the Great Courses Plus program, they have a subscription program. So uh, if you subscribe, then you have access to hundreds of courses, thousands of courses, and therefore tens of thousands of lectures. If you get tired of a course, just switch to another course. I do it all the time. I'll I'll hit two or three or half a dozen lectures in a particular subject. I get bored, or I just just want to try something different, and I'll switch to new new one. So let's just see what pops up here, because they also are pretty current. So I hit that, and we get America's long struggle against slavery. Okay, it's pretty obvious why that's um, why that's popped up now. As I'm recording this in the middle of the um, riots and and uh, looting and all that over the death of uh, George Floyd, and uh, so I touch on that, and then you get a list of the lectures to choose from. Understanding the fight against slavery, the origin of slavery in the British Empire, the African slave trade, and so on and so forth, all the way down. Slavery in the War for Independence, uh, the Haitian Revolution. It looks like there is 30 lectures ending in slavery by another name, probably slave labor, and fighting modern slavery. So I'm going to listen to a few of those. The deal is, if you um, if you go to their site, the Great Courses. Um, greatcoursesplus.com slash salon, you get a free trial And uh, as a listener of my podcast. So I recommend it. I consume their lectures all the time along with uh, audiobooks, so I recommend that you do that. Perfect time in this era of social isolation. So with that, thanks for the support from the greatcoursesplus.com slash salon. My guest today is Maria Konakova. Her book is The Biggest Bluff. How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Maria Konnikova is the author of Mastermind and The Confidence Game. She's a regular contributor, contributing writer to The New Yorker and has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Slate, The New Republic, The Paris Review, The Wall Street Journal, Salon, The Boston Globe, Scientific American, Wired, and Smithsonian, among many other publications. Her writing has won numerous awards, including the 2019 Excellence in Science Journalism Award from the Society of Personality and Social Psychology. While researching The Biggest Bluff, Maria became an international poker champion and the winner of over $300,000 in tournament earnings. Maria also hosts the podcast The Grift and is currently a visiting fellow at NYU's School of Journalism. Her podcasting work earned her a National Magazine Award nomination in 2019. She graduated from Harvard University and received her PhD in psychology from Columbia University. She was a student of the great Walter Michel, who she talks about in this book, and she dedicates the book to it, in fact. Anyway, it's a great conversation, super interesting material, basically applying a lot of um, the principles of, of psychology to a particular game, in this case, poker. But really, it's not about poker. The, the book is about Life and luck and chance and skill and uh, all the elements of of human psychology that go into uh, determining how lives turn out and so we get into the into the weeds of all that. So with that, enjoy listening. So it's a self help book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I was uh, actually my first question for you was going to be how, what motivated you to do this. Until I got to the section when you took a helicopter to Monte Carlo to play in a tournament, I thought, okay, I know why she's doing this. She wants to be the first female James Bond. <laughs> and in fact, you even had a line in there, Kona, Konakova, Maria Konakova. That's me. Yeah. I don't know what kind of martinis you prefer. Oh, you don't drink during tournaments. That's right. Not during tournaments, but after. Yes, I would, after. I would right. love. I would love a martini shaken, not stirred. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I love the book. Super interesting uh, uh, in terms of uh, just the avenue of you doing this. This sort of genre of going out to try something you know nothing about, learning it, mastering it, and then writing about it. George Plimpton famously did this back in the 60s when he yep. uh, was a quarterback for the Detroit Lions for one game, I guess, <laughs> or part of the season. And, and then he, he tried boxing. And it's so interesting to get a, a writer's perspective from inside, uh, starting off knowing nothing. So let, let's maybe start there. You're Previous book was on con artists, and you met a lot of these con con artists and 
figured out how con games work. So in a way, you're trying to do something similar, but but a little bit different related to luck and chance and probabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, it, it's funny. Um, a lot of people assume that I came to poker because of the confidence game, that somehow in the world of con artists, I became interested in, you know, the the world of games and all of this and, and decided to try my own hand at deception. And that's not at all what happened. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, I can see how there's kind of an evolution of my books from Sherlock Holmes and the detective side to con artists and kind of the criminal side to poker and let me do it myself type of thing. Um, but that's only in retrospect. Um, in the moment, I came to poker from just from a very different angle. Um, I became fascinated by the role that chance plays in our lives by this question of, you know, how much do we actually control and how much is luck? You know, how much of where I am today, of what I've accomplished, of who I am, what I've been able to do, how much of that is kind of my skill, my hard work, and how much of that is just sheer chance, you know, the the luck of the ovarian lottery <laughs> to begin with, you know, how I was born, what my genetic makeup is, you know, who I am, where I was born, kind of all of these different things. And then throughout life, how how different things might break one way or another and your life might change completely depending on that. And sure, you control a lot of things, but then there are th these other, there's just this noise, this variance that you don't control and it just, and it happens. And I became really fascinated by this. Um, and sorry, did you want to, did well, you want to interrupt that, me? <laughs> you have that great quote from, uh, uh, Dawkins, uh, that yeah. it, it's one of the great passages in the history of science writing uh, it's, toward the, it's toward the end of, end of your book, but I think it summarizes nicely what you're saying here. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will, in fact, never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. In the teeth of these stu stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. That's amazing. I it mean, is. that's, it's, that's really kind of well captures it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's something that I've just, I've thought about a lot um, in my life. I mean, in a way, when I was getting my PhD in psychology, it was a big theme control. And one of the things that I studied was the illusion of control or when we think we're in control, but we're actually not. Um, we're actually in an environment where things are happening that we have no power over. And yet we somehow think that we're controlling the outcome. And people are so capable of this. I mean, I was able to recreate a classic study from the 70s where people flipped um, flipped a coin, um, but they I had them flip it online. And in the original study, the experimenter would flip it and they had to guess heads or tails. Um, and they were told if they were right or not. And the actual number of heads or tails was the same in every condition, but sometimes they were told it was a rigged study that they were right um, in a kind of random way. Sometimes they were right a lot at the beginning, and sometimes they were right a lot clustered near the end. And it turns out that when they were right a lot at the beginning, they fell for the illusion of control. They started saying things like, oh, I'm actually really good at predicting coin tosses. <laughs> um, if, I, if I practice, I'm going to get better. If I'm not distracted, I will be even better. These things that make it seem like it's a skill, even though it's it's total chance, right? You're flipping a coin on the computer and trying to see if it's going to land heads or tails. There's right. no skill in that. And yet smart people would actually answer that. And you you realize how easy of an illusion that is to fall for if even in a coin toss you you can actually start thinking you're much more in control than you are. So it's something that's always been on my mind. But I had I had a period of, of bad luck where a lot of a lot of things happened at the same time. My grandmother died and it was just a freak accident. It's not like she was sick. She slipped during the night and hit her head. Um, I got really sick um, with an autoimmune disease. Husband lost his job. My mom lost her job. Just all of these things happening at once. And I and I just stopped for a second and thought, whoa, like you think you've got it under control and then life happens and these things that you can't change happen. Um, and I wanted to write about it. I wanted to explore it. I wanted to find a way to kind of go deeper into that topic. And whenever I'm starting anything new, I read a lot. 
and I just read everything I can get my hands on. And as you mentioned, um, I started reading about game theory. And I read John von Neumann's Theory of Games, which is the foundational text of game theory, and learned that not only was von Neumann a poker player, but that poker had inspired game theory, Hmm. that he had seen this game and thought, this is a great model for strategic decision making in life, because it's a game of incomplete information, just like life. So it's not chess where you see the whole board, where you can calculate the right move, where there's theoretically a solution if you give me enough computing power to to find it because everything is out there. But it's rather something where there's hidden information. There's things that I know that you don't know. There are things that you know that I don't know. There are things we know in common. And then we have to try to figure out what is the other person thinking? He has this wonderful quote where he says, real life consists of bluffing of little tactics of deception, of figuring out what does this man think I mean to do? And that's what games are about in my theory. And that's just so powerful. What does this man think I mean to do? It's not what does I mean to, what do I mean to do? It's what does he think? And then does he know that I think he means to do that? And you can go on and on and on in this iterative process. And it's just, it's, it can break your mind if you, (laughs) if you let it go on long enough. And that just fascinated me. And I thought, I need to look more at poker. I'm curious what this game is that inspired this great mind um, to create this theory. And so I started reading about poker. And something just clicked in my mind. I thought, oh, can this be the book? What if I learn to play the game myself? What if I actually immerse myself in this world and use that journey as a way of exploring chance, of exploring kind of the, the role that it plays in our lives of exploring the limits of skill. Yeah. Before we go down that journey, I, I love the epigram you have here from uh, Fausto Maestral in Tom Pynchon's five or yeah, life's single lesson that there is more accident to it than a man can ever admit to in a lifetime and stay sane. Here I, <laughs> I think of, uh, there's a famous quip about conspiracy theories that um, you know, there's no cigarette smoking man behind the scenes running the world. There's no lizard aliens that have come here that, that, that run the show. In fact, scarier than that is that nobody's in charge. You know, no one runs the economy. No one understands how the economy works and, you know, why wars start or whatever. In other words, that's kind of scarier that, 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 it, that there's this huge role of randomness because we can't control that or even really understand it. Other than in a life insurance uh, statistical way saying, well, you know, if we have enough people and, uh, you know, they're going to die at this age or whatever. But that's just, uh, you know, these predictions under uncertainty. And then the other um, uh, response to that, to, to, to your background there is, um, you know, all of really politics, foreign, foreign, foreign affairs, foreign relationships, you know, the whole mutual assured destruction Cold War strategy is a game theory. You know, yes. just think about uh, Kim Jong-un now. You know, why does he have nuclear weapons? Well, for one reason, any country that has nuclear weapons, the United States does not fuck around with. You know, we take them seriously. So yeah. if you want to be taken seriously, you want a, a chair at the big boy table, really, at the, say, the final the final table at the, you know, Poker World Championships, you got to have the goods, right? So, uh, but, you know, we're not deities, we're not omniscient. So uh, everything is under uncertainty and particularly human action. You know, he knows that I think that he's going to think that I'm going to, you know, and you just get this iterative response and, yeah, it gets super complicated from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have a line yeah. about uh, you're not really playing the cards, you're playing the other players or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, you, uh, you don't play the cards, you play the man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. So just just some of the background on that, since you've mentioned men, you said something like it's 97% men in, in, in this yes, sport? Or 97% game or, male why is that? Um, in any given field. I think for a few reasons. Um, one, historically, um, it was a game. So it's called the variant that I play. And the most common variant today is called Texas Hold'em for a reason. It originated kind of in, in Texas. Hmm. And the people who played it were people with names like Amarillo Slim. Um, who was, you know, wore this cowboy hat um, where he had, you know, rattles of snakes that he said he killed with his own bare hands and boots with gold buckles and, you know, all of these things and carried a gun and was involved in 
a lot of violent stuff. Um, hmm. And, you know, historically, it was a man's game. It was played, it's, it originated in the U.S., as far as we know, um, on steamboats um, in New Orleans. Hmm. That's how it came. That's how it spread um, in this country. And then was played in saloons and kind of during westward expansion, there weren't that many women there. You know, they weren't welcome in those types of environments. And so um, it was originally kind of this this very very much a man's game. And I think it then developed this reputation and was picked up in popular culture as this thing that these guys do in Stetsons in dark lit yeah. rooms with these big cigars. Um, and then someone bursts through the door with a big gun and starts <laughs> shooting. Right. <laughs> and, and so I think that that kind of image probably kept a lot of women from, from mm. entering the game to begin with. And, you know, there's also this, puritanical aspect of it that people think of poker as gambling um they think that oh this is like a, a sinful thing mm. that's not for, for women um one of the things that i stress over and over in my book is that poker actually isn't gambling and i don't think of myself as a gambler right. um, it's a game of skill and i'm a poker player i'm not a gambler right. i don't like gambling um but and most people have an attitude like your grandmother exactly exactly so yes i um uh, i quote my grandmother sorry grandma <laughs> <laughs> um, who was not at all thrilled um, about this enterprise and who thought I was just throwing away my life and soul <laughs> and everything else and um, was heartbroken that I entered the world of poker. She's going and to nothing- Vegas and she's going to run away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What's a good Jewish girl doing <laughs> playing poker? Why couldn't I have played chess like, <laughs> like a normal human being? <laughs> so, so I think that there's, there's that as well. And then there's the fact that because of these two things, it's been predominantly male. It's developed a very male culture. And so when you enter a casino and sit down at kind of the lowest stakes of the game um, as a female, you're not going to you're not likely to see other women and you're likely to encounter some unpleasant individuals. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky in that, you know, I came in as a journalist. And so I knew exactly why I was there. I had a bigger goal. And so if you know, bad stuff happened. If I was called something nasty at the table, if something really negative happened, I could write it off as a good story. You know, as Nora Ephron says, everything is copy. (laughs) So I could, I could say that and say, everything is copy. This is okay. And I had this incredible mentor, Eric Seidel, who's one of the greatest players in the world and one of the nicest human beings ever, who was just this incredibly generous, kind, thoughtful, wonderful person who became this father figure who introduced me to all of these other wonderful people and protected me. And I had this safety net right from the beginning of these amazing players who had my back. But had I not had that, I can definitely see myself walking into a casino, sitting down thinking, oh, this is fun. I'm going to try to learn poker, having a horrible experience, walking out and saying never again. Right. Did did a lot of the players you played with know that you were writing a book or doing a journalistic exploration of this? At the beginning, no, nobody did. Um, Mm. The people who Eric introduced me to did. So all of the high roller players, like the people who are the best in the world, knew from the beginning that I was writing a book because Mm. they started helping me. Mm. They started helping to coach me. They they were excited. They wanted to make themselves available to be part of this journey. Um, And so they all knew. But then when I sat down at a random tournament, no one knew who I was. And it's not like I sat down and said, hi, I'm Maria. I'm a journalist. <laughs> right. I'm here to write about you. Right, right. Um, so, so I didn't blow my cover. And it took, it took a while. And it was actually very nice when no one recognized me. I didn't hmm. value my anonymity again, uh, uh, enough. Now did, now, now, did you wear like a hat and sunglasses and all that we see no. on TV? No. Nope, I don't wear anything. I actually think that... And I, I don't uh, encourage other people to do it. If someone asks me, you know, should I? Um, I actually think that you give off more than you pick mm. up mm. because you're going to sometimes like players will only put their sunglasses on in certain moments mm. and take them off. That's a tell. You know? Yes. Or, or the same thing uh, with their hats. You know, they I think that it, you just you're much more prone the more accessories you have the more you might mess up and right, give something off. Right. And also it's just much less comfortable. I think you, you don't pick up as much if you're wearing sunglasses inside. Right, right. I mean, it's uncomfortable. You don't, you don't notice as much. So I think you're actually giving up something by doing that. Well, some of the stories you have in there are pretty funny. They make good, good copy. The guys are either <laughs> treating you 
in a sort of misogynistic way, calling you what little sister or little girl or little girl, little girl, <laughs> or the guys that would hit on you. The funniest one was the guy who, you know, uh, wanted to buy you a drink, and you said, "Well, well, I'm married. I don't drink during poker, and, and and I'm married. Oh, I'm married too. No problem." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, like a like a like a Seinfeld episode where where George Costanza. Sh- sh- Found out that if he shows the picture of his deceased fiance, you know, women were super interested. So this guy shows you a picture of his allegedly deceased uh, infant, yeah, which that I, was, I mean, that was probably that, a that bullshit story. One of these, it was such a surreal moment. I'm like, <laughs> seriously, you're you're showing me a picture of your dead son and trying to get me to sleep with you. This is <laughs> this is bizarre. So maybe as a, a, a PSA in in the Me Too movement, you want you want to make a statement, something like this: this doesn't work, guys. <laughs> no, it's not good. It's not good. I do not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so for Texan Hold'em, just for those who are not familiar with it, you get yeah. two cards down. Each yep. player gets two cards down, and only you see them. And then there's yep. three or four cards that are face up. So at first three, yeah, that's three. the flop, yeah. and then you have one round of betting after that, and then you get one more, the fourth. That's the turn. And then there's one round of betting and then you get to the river. So in total, if you end up playing the hand to the end and not all hands make it that far, there are going to be five cards in the middle. Right. And you are going to play your best combination of five cards using any combination of the board and the cards that you hold. Right. And um, uh, and so the, the, the uncertainty is you don't know what everybody else has under their two cards. Exactly. And, 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 but, you know, if you have a certain card, like, let's say there's certain cards in the uh, that are turned up. I forget what that's called now. The, 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 the flop. The flop. Um, and, uh, and, and, and and you know, you have, like, say, the third ace or the, the two aces yep. and there's two aces there. So the other pl- players, they don't know that those cards are not available because you have them. I forget what that's called. You're blocking bl- blockers. T- blockers. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, so it already it's getting pretty complicated. Yeah. In terms of doing the and calculations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, the math can get the math can get a little tricky, but the math really is more or less straightforward. As long as you know what I didn't know at the beginning, which is how many cards there are in a deck. I had, I guess, the wrong number. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um Yep, I thought there were 54. Turns out there are 52. Um, as long as you know that, um, then you can kind of calculate outs. Like you can do basic calculations. And That's these are really done with all- a single deck, right? Yes. At the so table, there's only right? one deck. Right. And and so that makes it quite easy. Yeah. Um, I mean, much simpler. I, I won't say quite easy, but there's nothing complicated there. But it gets more complex when you're starting to think through the different thought process. So what you were alluding to is blockers. So, you know, when I hold a card, I know that nobody else can hold it, but they can also, it, sometimes it will be a very powerful card to use to bluff because, you know, if I have, for instance, the ace of spades and there are two spades on the board, I am blocking the nut flush draw, even if my other card isn't a spade. So mm. if my two, both my cards were spades, I'd be, I'd have the nut flush draw in my hand, but I'm blocking it so I can represent it, right? Mm. Because, because I have that ace, no one else can have the nut flush draw. Mm. So I can play in a much more aggressive way because I have this one key card. But then if someone else gets really aggressive, I actually start to get worried because they don't have it. So that means that I'm unblocking, you know, that, that particular Mm. combination for them. And so if they don't have the ace of spades, what do they have if they're being, so aggressive, like maybe they have a really strong hand. So you actually have to start thinking through all of these different levels and it becomes a game of psychology um, as much as a game of math, if not more so. And when you say they're, they're acting aggressive, you mean in their betting? Yes. So you can figure out you're never going to see their cards and they're never going to see your cards. They can make inferences based on how you act. You can make inferences based on how they act. And that means both the betting patterns, you know, how you're betting, how much you're betting, and physically, how you're sitting, how you're Mm. acting, you know, what you're saying, what you're doing. Everything is going to add up in in one way or another. And some people don't give off much physically at all. You know, some people are just very stoic. They don't have many tells. I think most people have, like, tiny tells sometimes, but good players, it's not like you're going to see every time he has a strong hand, 
his shoulder goes like that or, you know, twitches <laughs> yeah. or, or whatever. That, that, that doesn't happen. But even if that um, did happen, somebody could be faking that. Like, I'm going to give yes. off the tell that I have a good hand when I don't. And that's part of the bluff. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so it's a very, it's a very nuanced process where you try to then figure out over time, you know, how, how does this fit into how they've been behaving? How does this fit into how they bet in other hands? How does this fit into the pattern of information that I already have? And so you're constantly updating. You're constantly updating your kind of the probabilities in your in your head based on these new data inputs. And you're kind of constantly putting them into that file on this player. You know, okay, well, I remember that an hour ago when he had this very strong hand because we actually saw it. So I had all the information, you know, he acted in this way. He raised on the river, you know, he, he did this, he did that. Is he doing that right now? Yes, he is. Okay. Well, is this going to be another piece of information? It depends. Am I going to get to see what cards he has? How predictive is it? It's, it gets very complicated very quickly, but as you start doing it more and more, you start getting used to the process. What questions should I be asking? Mm. What should I be looking at? What should I be updating? So even though you might be wrong in this particular instance, you might make a mistake, you're learning and you're honing your process so that next time your process is better and next time you're less likely to make that mistake. Do you think a lot of those calculations are being done subconsciously just by dint of experience? That is to say, you kind of have a sense that I should do this or that although you're not making a rational calculation because you've already done that so many times it now comes intuitively. Yeah. For some people, yes. For like people chess, like players, chess players can look at a board and know, well, I'm going to do this. They don't have to sit there and go, and if he does this, then I do this, then it. Yes. So I think that for players with a lot of experience who are very good, like like Eric Seidel, my coach, um, absolutely. A lot of this is subconscious at this level um, because they're experts. They're right. people who have thousands of hours of, ex of experience in this. And so when Eric says, well, this feels right, what he really means is I know this is right because I've exper I've run through this calculation a thousand times, 10,000 times right. before. Um, but it's not like he's doing it explicitly and it's not like he has explicit access to what he's doing in the moment. So he says, well, this feels right. But if you then run, you know, run a computer solver and have them try to find the optimal way to play that hand. And they say the exact same thing. You're like, yep, Eric's feels right. It's the same as this right. Monte Carlo simulation doing it many times for me. That's not the case. I mean, I don't have that depth of experience right. um, because I'm much newer to the game. Um, and so for me, when I think something feels right, I should be deeply skeptical of that because that is mm. not something that's based in expertise and experience. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we need to learn that saying something feels right or following your gut, following your intuition is a very, very dangerous thing because human beings are not good at, at figuring out if the intuition is right or not. In fact, all of the studies show that we're no better than chance at, right. at discerning which one is the true intuition and which one is the false intuition. They all feel the same. Now, now do you mean something by that different than rapid cognition? Or are those the same? Um, I do. I mean, something slightly different because the way that we experience intuition is we feel like, oh, this gut feeling and rapid cognition, I think, is actually a little bit more conscious. Like we mm. we have this very conscious process. We're not quite sure how we accessed it, but we're conscious of having been thinking, if that makes sense. Yeah. And with intuition, we're not even con conscious of that. We're like. Oh, my gut tells me. Right. Um, we're in a very different part of our body. Um, and I'm just I'm very distrust, distrustful of that word intuition. Yeah. And I think that yeah. um, I think that we need to be very skeptical um, when we say things like, oh, you know, well, I feel it in my gut. OK, well, do you have any reason to trust it? Have you been playing this game for 30 years right. and winning? Right. If so, OK, I trust your intu intuition. If not. I don't care about your intuition. Trust the math. Trust the trust the calculations. Well, in a way, your coach then ha he does have a database uh, that he's accessing he just from experience, and he doesn't even have to think about it. He just kind of has a feeling, but the feeling is grounded in something. Absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah, and that and that something is deep experience, right? 
for just a moment, I was reminded of the, the famous Wasson test, you know, where subjects have to turn over two cards to test a hypothesis and they do very bad at it. Kind of a logic puzzle. But, you know, two being Cosmetes here at UC Santa Barbara, evolutionary psychologist showed that if you reconfigure the problem as a social relationship thing, like which customers in a bar do I test their ID to see if they're uh, of legal age to drink? People are much better at figuring that yeah. out because it's a it's ecologically natural. That is to say, interacting with other people comes naturally. We're better at solving those kind of social problems. So maybe some rapid cognitions or intuitions like uh, feeling untrustworthy or anxious in a certain environment, uh, maybe those are more reliable than, say, the gambler's fallacy, which you're going to fall for every time because we didn't evolve yep. in a gambling environment. <laughs> I think I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, um, it's really interesting. So since you're since you're talking about some of the psychological work, um, I think that um, one of the studies, and I don't remember, I don't actually think I cited it in the book. Um, maybe I do. No, I do. Um, Damasio's work on do, um, yes. <laughs> um, on people who actually have brain lesions um, right. to the VMPFC, and they can't experience emotion. They don't experience risk, so they have no they have no problem taking max risk. They don't have these biases of risk aversion. They don't care. You know, they have a brain lesion, and they do really poorly in gambling tasks, even though you think that it would actually be good to not be experiencing this fear and these aversive emotions, they go broke because it mm. turns out that that fear is telling you something really important, that sometimes your emotions are actually integral to the situation and they're giving you important information and you should be listening to them. Right. It's, not, it's, it's not like you should always be dismissing your emotion. Sometimes it's telling you, hey, you're going to go broke. Stop. You need to be risk averse. Sometimes that kind of feeling of fear yeah is really important. And I think that the studies that you're, you're, that you're referring to and kind of thinking about, oh, you know, does the environment make me uncomfortable in some, in some way? I think that those are more of that level emotion, which is actually very powerful and can be telling you something very important that you should be listening to. And if you don't listen to it, maybe you're going to go broke. Yeah, whether it's in life or at the poker table. Reminds me of Kevin Dutton's research on psychopathy, where yeah. he, he says, you know, there's a, actually a good side to psychopathy because you want high risk takers, say, in, in, at a Wall Street trading firm or you know, as a politician or especially as someone like a, a Navy SEAL. So he's got this story in his book where uh, the British equivalent of the special forces, Navy SEALs, you know, these are just badass motherfuckers. And, and the, <laughs> like the final test is they got this guy down on the ground, blindfolded, and they fire up this big truck engine. And then they roll this tire right up to his head and like push it up against there. If he doesn't flinch. That's our guy. <laughs> now, you and I, for most of our life, we don't want to act like that. That's a that's a crazy way yeah. to be. But if you're sending somebody into a really nasty situation, that's who you want, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's really funny. Okay, that's just a couple more story. basics now. In the book, you talk about the buy-in to start, like you know, five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. ten thousand, hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Oh my god! Now, yep. is that how these uh, poker tournaments are funded for the prize money from the entry fee, or do they have corporate yeah. sponsors and things like that as well? No, no, it's it's uh it's all the entry fees. So your prize pool. So normally let's say in a 1k tournament, the buy-in will actually not be exactly a thousand dollars, but depending on the tournament, it might be like 1100 and a thousand will go to the prize pool. And then 100 will go to kind of paying for the costs of the tournament. So they'll go for like the dealers and the room and all of that. Um, so that's kind of how the house makes money or, or funds it. Um, but that's, that's how it works. So if it's a thousand dollar buy-in and you know, 10 people buy in, then you have a $10,000 prize pool that's going to be divided um, ultimately um, among the top, usually 15% of the field, 10 to 15% of the they field. Get, they, they, and, they, they get prize money. Yeah. How do they, uh, just curious, how do they pay for like the room at the Rio for the week? You have to pay the Rio to rent that. That's all part of the prize. So money. that's the rake. So that's actually okay. the, that's that extra hundred dollars okay. or whatever right. it is that's right. added on to turn up um, the, to each buy-in because that adds up because I said, you know, 10 people buy in because that's easy math right. and math is still not my strong suit. <laughs> um, I got better at it through poker, but I'm still 
not the best mental math person, but in the, at the World Series, you get tens of thousands of people. Oh wow! And sometimes the the buy-ins, you know, for a ten thousand dollar event, you know, they might be making five hundred dollars off of each of that buy-in and rake um, or whatever. And then people are also playing cash games, and cash games are raked. So every time that you know there's a pot, a certain amount gets taken out of it, um, and pays pays the house so that's that's how they pay okay so you know you and have, then, and you then have, when you put you 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 put your entry fee in whatever it is say ten thousand yep. dollars you get a pile of chips and everybody gets the same number of chips yeah so and when you're talking about like you're sitting at the table and your chips are low the, yep. the, the reason that's a disadvantage is because if somebody starts raising you can only go so far and i presume yep. unlike in a bond movie you can't throw your ten thousand dollar brightling watch into the pot and go okay i'm in <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> correct, correct. In a cash game, you might be able to, but not in a tournament. Okay. So in a tournament, you buy in for a certain amount of money and that's it. Um, especially at the World Series where most events are freeze outs um, or a lot of events are freeze outs. Once you bust, you're out. It's not like a cash game where not only if you're getting low, you can add on. You can say, hey, come here. I've got another million dollars for you, you know, because I'm James Bond. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. So, Give me another million. You can't do that. Once you once your chips are gone, the only way to get them back is to win them back. Right. Um, because in a tournament, unlike a cash game, each chip is worthless. It's just there as a relative measure of where you stand um, relative to the other players. And your goal is to eventually the, the winner of the tournament will gather all the chips and have all of the chips. So right? if, but they if, don't actually have cash value. If your chips are low and let's say you you think you have a pretty good hand or you know you have a good hand, but the other somebody else at the table also thinks that and you have 100 chips left and he raises you 150 chips, uh, too bad. You just have to you can't you can't match it. Well, it depends. Well, no, 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 no. What ends up happening if you want to match it, you put in 100 and what happens is a side pot is created. Oh, so. If no one else calls, then he gets to keep his 50 chips and only 100 go in the middle okay. um, to match yours. But if someone else calls, so say someone after you also thinks they have a great hand and they call the 150. So all of a sudden you're going to have two pots. You're going to have the main pot, which is going to have 300 chips because you only have 100. And then you're going to have the side pot between those two players that you're not eligible for. That's going to have 100, the 50 plus 50. Right. And you are all in. You have no more chips. So you now sit out for the rest of the hand and the most you can ever win is that 300. Those two players, let's say each one of them has a thousand chips, you know, they can actually, that side pot can get big. That side mm. pot can suddenly have 2000 chips. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, if they get it in, cause they're, they're allowed to keep playing. Um, and so, but you can't win those chips. Yeah. That's how that works. And just another general question, how big an industry is professional poker? I mean, like billions a year. I don't know how, who keeps track of that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, if you if you're actually counting um, online poker as well, and if you're counting globally, absolutely billions a year. And I presume the IRS has a way of keeping track of all this sort of thing, so they know who who to collect from. Um, yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's very it's weird um, because in in the U.S., online poker is only legal in a few states, um, and like for mm. instance, I'm in New York, I can't play online. Um, but when you play live for everything over $5,000 in a tournament, um, it, you get an IRS form and everything. Okay, right. Um, so, <laughs> so it's, um, it's just like any other, um, earning. cash business. Yeah. Earning business. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So from the beginning, Dan, you played about a year and a half or two years, um, about two years, about two years. And how much have you ever calculated how much you spent total and how much you won? And, and did you make money? Um, I did make money. Um, I won um, over 300000 but that's not how much I actually made because there were lots of expenses and buy-in costs along the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I, I've never actually sat down and done the, the calculation, but I'd say like maybe at the end of it, I made around 100000 something like that. Yeah. That's pretty good. But yeah, I, was, I, yeah. was, I was impressed with some of the earnings of some of these big guys. It's amazing. Like tens oh, of yeah, millions. Oh, yeah, millions. Tens of millions. Yep. Absolutely. But, it, but is it a little bit like the lottery where, you, let's say, 10,000 people enter the World Series of Poker? How many of them realistically have a chance to get to the finals versus they're just fodder for, for, for the real pros? Um, not many. Yeah. But it's, but it's not, I mean, it's not the lottery in the sense that, 
you know, you can, if you play well, um, you also have to get lucky, but you can get, you can get pretty far. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that, um, as with any, as with anything, to, I think as we said at the beginning of the conversation, poker isn't gambling. It's a game of skill, Yeah. but there's an element of chance in it. Of course there is, there isn't almost anything in anything in life. There's an element of chance. And so variance only evens out over the long term and your mm. skill edge becomes apparent over the long term. So if I were to, you know, sit down and play with Eric Seidel, um, who's a much better player than I will ever be, um, I might beat him in one hand mm. because I just have better cards right. or I might beat him in one game because, you know, I get lucky that one game, but the more games we play, he's going to win. Right. He's going to eventually take all my money, even if I'm running really well at the beginning. But in any given tournament, anything is possible. And I think that's kind of part of the allure of poker for a lot of people right. Right. because in the immediate term, like that one hand, that one day, um, there's a big chance element. Now, if you roll that out to a week, a month, a year, the chance recedes and the skill rises. Right. But on any given day, anything can happen. <laughs> That's right. But if you played Eric Seidel a hundred times, he'd win 90 of them. Sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly over 80 of them. Yeah. He's, I mean, listen, I have no pretensions of, of being better than I am. <laughs> well, but this and is the point that, just, that it, it, pre presumably you're just as lucky as he is on, on the draw of the cards. The rest is skill. Yes. Yes. But sometimes um, I'm just as lucky as he is um, at the over time. Right. But that's why right. we need to play that many, that many right. games to because it. Yeah. it could just so happen that I'm just much luckier 10 times in a row. Like I could actually, maybe he will win on average 90 out of a hundred times that we play, but maybe I'm going to win those first 10 times. Like there's no, there's no reason to think that it's going to be spread out and, you know, or maybe I'm going to lose the first 10 games and just run out of money. And so I'll never even know that I would have won 10 uh, eventually. Yeah. So, so the variance isn't necessarily spread out in a way that makes sense to the human brain. Yeah. It's just going to. Because it's variance. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, you dedicated your book to Walter Michelle, of course, is a legend and, yeah. and now super famous because the marshmallow test has gone viral in the last few years. And there's all those parental advisory things like, you know, how to how to get your kid to delay gratification. <laughs> but of course, a lot of that was you know modified in the context of what kind of environment you're raised in. If you're raised in an environment, yeah. as you talked about as a child, where you, you never get the payoff. You know, delaying gratification doesn't pay off because it's an uncertain environment. Then you're better Absolutely. off taking the marshmallow now. Absolutely. And that's what Walter actually showed in his early work. So all of his early studies before he developed the marshmallow test, um, he was working in the East Indies um, with his first wife, who was an ethno ethnomusicologist, I believe. Um, and he had heard these rumors that, you know, half the island thought the other half was really impulsive <laughs> and the other half said, Oh, you know, like the ants and the grasshoppers. Um, and right. so he wanted to test it. And these were kind of the earliest marshmallow studies where he would come into the schools and he'd like give them little gifts and say, Oh, do you want to wait? You can get this much better gift in a week. And he realized that what he was testing instead was do these kids have a father figure at home? So the kids who were in stable households had no problem waiting. And so he concluded it, there were no differences between the you know, different sides of the island. It was, do you have a steady family? If you do have a father figure at home who's always been there, then you're going to wait because you'll know that this man will fulfill his promise and come back. And if you don't, if you have a, you know, a father figure who abandoned you, you're going to take that. You're going to take that pencil now. You're going to take that small treat right now because who the hell knows what this white man's going to do, you know, where he's going to come. And so he knew that right away. And that was actually the birth of the marshmallow studies. So then when they did the actual marshmallow studies, they spent weeks with these kids establishing trust and making it clear that the researchers always came back and kind of creating this environment of safety so that they knew that they were actually testing what they wanted to test. So a lot of people who have problems with the marshmallow study have actually never read any of mm -hmm. the work yeah. and don't actually realize what the original setup was. Yeah, that's really important to know that. I think a lot of 
people who read it, let's say with a conservative bent, think, well, that's, you know, some people are just born that way or they're you know, <laughs> by nature, they're good people. Therefore, they have yeah. uh, the ability to delay gratification. They're disciplined, you know, and this idea that, you, uh, you know, you're disciplined as a like a life choice. Well, you didn't choose to be born into a family no. that's intact. You, you just got lucky. Yep. Uh, exactly. And, and, exactly. And, and just right down the line, um, you know, if you are say high in openness to experience, high in risk taking, you're also high in conscientiousness to balance some of that. Uh, well, we know from behavior genetics, at least half of that's heritable. So you didn't choose Absolutely. to be. So the way I say it is that, like, if you wake up in the morning and you're full of vim and vigor, and you want to get out there and make your mark, and you're just so ambitious, high yeah. need of achievement, you want to make money or whatever, you know, you don't even really choose that. Now, at some point, you have yeah. this volition has some role. You have to choose to get right. up and get around. But some people just want to, and others yeah, just absolutely. don't. Absolutely, absolutely. It's funny. Walter had uh, this this expression that he uh, that he used that actually uh, I have heard from my grandparents a, a, as well, um, and it's this trait of butt in chairness. <laughs> so. Uh, do you have butt in chairness? Do you have what it takes to keep your butt in your chair oh, oh, in order in to chairness. do the work? Okay. <laughs> That's butt funny. Butt in chairness. Right, yes. right. That's funny. <laughs> There's a Yiddish word for it. Um, and <laughs> and it's really and it's a really it's a really funny thing that we would joke about um, because if you start unraveling it, well, the the butt in chairness part of it is kind of this. You think, well, that's hard work. That's skill. But a lot of it is genetics. Actually, yeah. you can actually inherit butt in chairness. And a lot of it <laughs> right. is, is learned from from your environment. Who were your role models? Did you see people actually like hunkering down when you were little? What was rewarded? What wasn't rewarded? It's becomes so hard to pull all of these things apart um, and to try to figure out, you know, it's it's chicken and egg problem. Yeah. And you just I think at the end of the day, you just have to realize that yes, you need to work hard and you need to try to maximize your skill and take responsibility for who you are and what you do. But you also have to acknowledge that, you know, that you're lucky or, um, you know, that that luck plays a, a huge role. And that if someone else isn't as successful as you, that does not necessarily mean anything about them other than that they weren't as lucky. Yeah, it's a huge role. I've been thinking more and more about that of how lives turn out and so much of it is luck. You know, when uh, Obama gave that famous speech, you didn't build it speech, you know, conservatives' yep. heads exploded. And uh, but, you know, when you actually kind of deconstruct what he said, it's all true. You know, I mean, we're driving on public roads and, and you know, he said something like, you know, you, you may have had a mentor or a teacher or a parent or somebody that helped you, gave you a nudge. And so on. That's all true. <laughs> uh, and that's pretty random. I mean, you know, you, you enter college, you take yeah. this class instead of that class, you get the great teacher instead of the other one that's not so inspirational. You know, you didn't really know that. So it's not a choice. So conservatives have this just world theory, as it's called, yep. that, you know, the poor are poor because they didn't work hard enough and they're lazy, something like that, rather than thinking of it as luck. Um, it, yeah. it, it, at that level, although I'm always hesitant to go too far on this because I th I do think human agency and free will has some it's very role. important, yeah. and I think you can't go too. F I think you you shouldn't go too far in either direction because in in one direction you've got predestination, <laughs> and then and right. then in the other direction you just have well I can't, can't take responsibility for anything. Sorry, like it's all it's all my genes and right. it's all it's all this and it's all that and that's also dangerous. Um, and I think that you need to realize that it's a combination and that it's always all of these different factors and that it's complicated. It's not black and white. I mean, human brains just want to reduce things to black and white. Right. We want to put labels on things. We want to make it simple. We want a story that's, you know, that's really easy to follow. It's shades of gray. It's complex. It's ambiguous. A lot of it is uncertainty, what you and I have been talking about. Like that line, uh, nature, nurture, either way, it's my parents' fault. <laughs> 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 exactly. exactly. Uh, but then the final element of, of uh, uh, chance or luck on that, or maybe call it contingency, is just when you happen to have been born or where. I mean, yeah. you know, I, f I feel more and more as I get older, lucky to have been born in America, lucky to have been born, say, in California, uh, lucky to have been in, in, in – my parents were divorced, but they both got remarried and I had, uh, you know, good family background. That, you know, I, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> yeah. and, and and now, you know, in, in the current circumstances, you know, I now kind of feel lucky to be white, 
or maybe lucky that I'm not not white. I'm not sure it's white privilege uh, so much as I'm not held back by my skin color. So if you want to call that a privilege, okay. If I was black, it would I wouldn't have that. Uh, yeah. perhaps. And, you know, again, uh, I had nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with my Absolutely. hard work or, or character at all. Um, Absolutely. And, and then that final example I gave you uh, by email was, you know, if, you know, had Bill Gates been born 10 years earlier, or 10 years later. Now I've met Bill Gates. He's just incredibly smart. You can just tell he's the smartest guy at the table and obviously hardworking um, and all that. He'd be successful probably in anything he would do, but not the richest person ever. Right. You know, there's a kind of timing for your skills at, at, with the culture needs at that moment. I mean, some people even put it down to like the month that he went to IBM with the software program or, or whatever that story is. You know, it could have gone either way. Mm-hmm. You know, the timing right down to that, like that day was when the moment happened that it went this way. You know, we're we're going to we're going to pay you a flat su- fee for your programming. You go, no, no, I just want a percentage or whatever it was, you know, and there's. Same thing like Oprah, you know, when she started, they were going to buy her program or pay her a monthly fee or whatever. And she goes, no, I want a percentage. Boom. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that kind of decision, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of luck on that. For sure. For sure. And it it is something that I think we need to be more aware of. Um, and like I said, it doesn't absolve you of responsibility, but it just makes you more aware of what a big role it plays. You know, the, I, I don't know if you've ever been asked this thought experiment, but um, I have a few times, if you had a time machine and it could only go in one direction, what would you choose, past or future? Mm. Um, and to me, the answer is simple, future, because I don't want to be born female or be a female in any other time <laughs> because, um, you know, it, it was, the world is still, you know, better for men than it is for women. But in the past, I mean, it was, it was a million times worse. And, you know, all of these things, all of these things that have happened in the past and not just my gender, but the fact that I'm Jewish, you know, now, please, thank you. I'll, 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 I'll I'll risk the future. But if I have to, uh, if I have to take one or the other, I'm definitely going forward rather than backward. Um, talk about luck, right? My life would have been so different if I had not left the Soviet Union. That was my parents. That wasn't mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so many, so many things just come together or not um, to make That's you who right. you are. Uh, what year did your parents leave the Soviet Union? 88. 80. Oh, wow. Just before the, um, mm-hmm. the fall of the wall. Incredible. But no one knew the wall was going to fall. Right. <laughs> right. So more you know, luck. That's the thing. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's incredible, right? And I think Columbia, most universities had were restricted all the way up until like the sixties, early sixties, I think, for Jews. Not yeah, to mention yeah. women and, and blacks and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely we're living in the best time you can live, despite the headlines, which look pretty bad. For sure. Uh for but sure. you know, compared to before it was worse. Yeah, I'd go forward. <laughs> If for nothing else, for scientific curiosity, just to know what the, there you go. So the explanation you and I, you and for I dark go- matter. Oh, dark matter. Consciousness. Oh, we figured that out a century ago. That's no problem. It's easy. Oh, okay. I <laughs> just want to know. So, yep. So you and I can travel forward in time together <laughs> and hope the world still exists. Yeah. Do, do, do you have any, uh, you want to make any comments about the, not just the Me Too, but also um, the whole moment we're going through with uh, the protests and, and Black Lives Matter and all that? No, I mean, listen, I support it completely. And I think this is a time where all I can do um, as someone who isn't black is listen, be supportive, try to donate to the causes that seem to support uh, support Black Lives Matter as much as possible Um, and, you know, give my expertise whenever possible. You know, if any black journalists want to talk to me or any anything like that about breaking in about connections. That's how I can help. Yeah. But it's not really a time for me to offer any opinions. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think it's a time to listen rather than to talk. And do you have and a sense as a psychologist by, by about, uh, about the police in terms of, in the context of say Phil Zimbardo's, um, you know, Stanford prison yeah. experiment and Milgram and all that, the, the debate there is to what extent do we all have this capacity to be evil or is it a few bad apples and most people are good or, you know, Phil's um, uh, motive is to look at the bad barrels that rot people. 
So I think mm-hmm. his philosophy is most people are basically good, but that rotten environments, uh, like at Abu Ghraib, for example, which was almost yeah. a mirror of the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, you know, and he, he gives examples of a couple of the guys that were guards there and how they had no record of being, you know, badasses and psychopaths at all. But you put them in this environment where that becomes the norm, you know, just abuse and, and beating uh, prisoners and so on. Or in this case, the police forces, you know, the, the way that they're trained, uh, you know, it, it, it could conceivably take somebody who is not really a racist, not a bigot, not an asshole and turn them into that. But, you know, but uh, what, what I'm after is kind of a deeper nature nurture or I don't know what uh, the nature of human yeah, nature question. I mean, I think it's so complex um, and I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, it's something that I was asked a lot when I um, was doing interviews for the confidence game. Mm. A lot of people would ask me, you know, as a confidence artist, uh, is someone born or mm. made mm. In- into a con artist? Right. Um, and. I would say neither, you know, you could be born with a psychopathic brain um, and turn out to be a prominent neuroscientist, Mm -hmm. which has happened. (laughs) That's right. Yes. (laughs) um, Because that's how your life turned out. Or you can turn into a con artist or you could turn into a serial killer. Um, And None of those paths are preordained. And so I think that what what I would say is you need predisposition, but you also need opportunity. Yeah. Um, and the one or the other alone is probably not enough. So with con artists, you know, given the opportunity to commit fraud, for instance, um, in just a, some small way, let's say, you know, you, you fudge the book a little bit um, when, you know, your investments don't go well which is how a lot of people who then ended up running huge Ponzi schemes got mm-hmm. started. Um, I'm going to cheat for so, just a little bit to catch up and then I'll go clear again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And exactly. then it never That's happens. Exactly and they, what they think. Yeah. So given the opportunity, not everyone's going to fudge the books. There's some right. people who just don't have it in them and won't do it and say, yeah, I'm going to take the loss. And so I don't think it's not like the opportunity makes someone cheat, like because they've been losing and they are afraid. No, you have to have the predisposition. But sometimes the person who has the predisposition is just going to get lucky and always make money. And that will they'll never be put to that test right. and they'll never know. And they'll end up, you know, in a very different walk of life rather than running a big Ponzi scheme. And so I think both things need to happen. And I think that's true of almost anything. So I think that there are different people out there. Um, I hesitate to, you know, I'm I'm an optimist at the end of the day about human nature. Um, I think you have to be. Um, I think, you know, it's just too depressing otherwise. Yeah. Um, so I yeah. want to believe in the good in people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's possible to bring that out, but yeah, bad environments are horrible. Um, and, you know, remember the full saying that it's the bad apple rots the whole barrel, right? right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. We, we don't want bad apples. Like the second you have a bad apple, chances are all the other ones are already rotten too. Um, and yeah. so, um, and so I think that it's some, something where the culture of rot um, can really spread and can make it so that there's just an opportunity for everyone. And then the good ones, the people who, you know, wouldn't have fudged the books, the people who are incapable of, of being brutal in these environments they just leave yeah because they get punished for speaking out they don't get promoted you know they don't get these opportunities and so they leave right and so they they self-select out um and so they they don't end up reforming anything from the inside because they can't um and can you really blame them for leaving no, i can't no no since you're in psychology you know the, the the positive psychology movement really didn't get started until the late 90s 1990s mm-hmm. i mean really the first century of our field was just studying all the negative aspects of the human condition, mental illness and depression and anxiety and violence and aggression and, 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 and so forth. So we have a lot of uh, research on why, you know, how, how to convert Germans into Nazis, say, you know, how to get people to, you know, shove Jews into gas chambers. We, we know how to do that. What we don't have a lot of understanding is, is the people that helped uh, and, yeah. and rescued Jews and, and hid Jews and, 
And there was probably a lot more that we that we just don't know about because they flew under the radar and, and psychologists yeah. didn't haven't really studied that much. And it's what and I mean, I think it's so it's so important to focus on that and to to find those dynamics. Um, I mean, Betsy Pollock um, in Princeton, who studies social norms, she has some amazing field work um, that she did in Rwanda after the genocide, where she actually looked at what was different about the villages that did not turn on one another. Oh. There were a few pockets of Rwanda where everyone was protected. And it ends up that all of them had one leader who said no and who stood up right. and who spoke out and who actually just went against that norm, turned off the radio and said, do not listen to that. Do not kill your families. Do not turn on your neighbors. Do not do any of this. Interesting. Um, and it was so powerful. And you know, one person, one voice was enough. And that that's a beautiful insight mm -hmm. that you can have if people are willing to speak out, if people who have powerful voices are yeah. willing to speak out, it makes a difference. Um, and to me, that kind of research is so valuable. And I really wish that we'd have more of it. The outliers, the people, you know, if you look, you know, at some of the Milgram studies, to me, some of the most interesting data points are never talked about. They're the people who are saying, are you out of your mind? No. <laughs> right. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do this. Are you insane? I'm reporting you. I'm reporting you for ethics violations. Right. No one report that. Those transcripts exist, too. Right. We, all, we only hear the transcript of the person who's electrocuting someone to death. But there were transcripts of people who, you know, yelled and stormed out and refused. Yeah. I, I want those people. Yeah, exactly. I did a, a, a replication of Milgram's experiment for a Dateline NBC show with Chris Harrison. And, and uh, so we, we ran seven people through the experiment. We, we built the shock box exactly the same. We used the same script. We had an actor. These were, uh, these were people trying out for a game show on NBC called What a Pain. Anyway, the, the first woman we brought in, she just looks at the shock box. Our guy tells her what is, what's going to happen. And she's like, uh, no, I think I'm good. He goes, no, 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 I'm good. She was nice about it. Like, I, I, I'm good. Really? I'm good. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, and I thought, oh, we're, we're not going to get anybody to do this. But eventually we did. The guys especially. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, I just had uh, Hugo Mercy on the podcast a few months ago. He has a book out called Not Born Yesterday. Mm -hmm. So his thesis is interesting that we're not as gullible uh, as skeptics, we, particularly we skeptics like D Danny Kahneman and all the irrationalities we exhibit with confirmation bias and so on. He thinks that actually we're, we're pretty skeptical by nature. He thinks most political advertising doesn't work. Uh, conspiracy theories are largely not... Uh, believed, or if they are, it doesn't affect people's votes. So, for example, if if you believe that Hillary is running a pedophile ring out of a pizzeria, and I show you that that's crazy and that's not right, you're not going to go, oh, in that case, I'll vote for Hillary. Because people that say that they believe that, they already hate Hillary anyway, right? So uh, then we got into talking about the Nazis and all that, because he had a chapter on this in which the question I've always tried to understand is how do you convert you know, 80 million Germans into 80 million Nazis. And, and the answer is they didn't. Most, most Germans did not accept the Nazi ideology, especially the extermination part of Nazi ideology. But if you suppress the media, you know, right, you control the press, and yeah. then pluralistic ignorance. If everybody thinks that everybody else thinks that the Nazi thing is okay, but they don't, but there's no way to communicate because everybody's been silenced, then yeah. the whole thing can float for decades, you know, for uh, you know, 12 years, on thin air, essentially. Yeah, for sure. And the radical voices are the only ones that are being covered. Um, right. And you know that, and also there's self-preservation. I mean, that's a huge, huge instinct. And if you think that speaking out is going to get you into one of the concentration camps, you're going to be quiet. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it, it takes, it takes the rare person to not be quiet then. To right. Say something. Right. Yeah. For totally understandable reasons. Um, well, just and can you blame them? Can you no, blame no, them? No, 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 not at all. I mean, I have a family and a home, and I, I don't want to. Exactly. You know, I'm just, yeah. You know, so everyone but, thinks they're going to be a hero yeah, until they're nah, put in that situation. Nah, I know. Yeah, very rare to. A uh, couple more things before I, I let you go because we've been going an hour now. Just um, uh, on, you also discuss uh, time discounting and you talk about eating 
uh, during <laughs> tournaments and not drinking and so on. So talk a little bit about the research on, you know, a, a time discounting and, and, and the, the brain consumes a lot of energy. I know Baumeister yeah. had some research about self-control and calorie consumption that has been challenged. Yes. Uh, but I haven't seen that I, research in a while. Yeah. So, I, so this isn't quite that because that research has been challenged and I've actually um, done some studies that show that that research is not necessarily what it, what it was, yeah. uh, what it seemed to be. Not that, not that his results necessarily were wrong. It's that I think that there were other interpretations possible that were not controlled for. Um, and, um, but what the research has found in terms of delay discounting and food and decision making is when you have other very high priorities, such as you're hungry <laughs> or you really, really need to pee. Like that's actually, <laughs> there's, there's work on this. I, I, I it's hilarious. It's, and I think, funny. I mean, who decided to design this study, yeah. get IRB institutional review board for people who don't know what it is approval for it right. <laughs> and then actually run it on these poor undergraduate students who are being given lots of water and not allowed to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but you it actually affects your decisions whether you whether you think that it will or not and you start wanting smaller sooner rewards rather than waiting for larger later rewards because things become much more immediate and things become much more pressing and if you ask people you know do you make worse decisions when you need to eat or when you need to pee um they probably We'll say, well, no, like that doesn't really affect me. Like I know I'm hungry, but yeah. but there's such a close connection between kind of emotions and and how we're feeling and different elements of of our bodies. We're such a connected machine. I mean, our brains and our bodies are in such close sync. It's crazy. I mean, one of the in later in my book, um, and I was actually I was really surprised at some of these studies. Um, I did some research when I was looking into superstitions and kind mm. of the superstitions around poker on nocebo effects. Mm. So the opposite of the placebo effect. Um, and there are people who basically killed themselves because they thought that they were dying. And so their brain oh, right. just made themselves made them sick. There was one case of a man who was given two months to live because they said he had very aggressive metastatic cancer and he died. Um, and then they did an autopsy and it, he was misdiagnosed. He had a benign tumor that couldn't mm. have killed him. But he was so positive that he had this cancer that his brain just kind of killed his body in a way. Right. And there are people who think they've been cursed by voodoo doctors who suddenly get really <laughs> sick. But if the curse is reversed, they start getting better. There are people who try to commit suicide. There was one study of a um, of a guy who took a bunch of antidepressants. Oh, yeah. um, he was in a study um, to kill himself because he was so depressed. Um, and when he was admitted to the hospital, they thought he was going to die because all of his vitals were so terrible. Then it ended up he'd taken the placebo. Um, <laughs> he wasn't even taking the antidepressant. And then when he was told that, all of a sudden everything cleared up and the guy was fine. Yeah. Uh, but it's crazy. That's our brain. Right, That's what our mind right. can do. That's what our mind is capable of. So to me, it's not at all strange that if we're fasting, we're not going to make decisions in the same way as when we've just had a good meal. If we're hungry, if we have all of these you know, different things going on in our body, it's going to affect how we think through things. And sometimes people have found a little bit of a benefit because it, you start relying on something you and I talked about right at the beginning, your gut, your intuition. Mm -hmm. That's only good if you're an expert, you know, mm -hmm. if you can rely on that. Otherwise, that's just, you know, this wrong instinct because you just want to act quickly. You become much more reflexive. You become much less reflective. You mentioned Danny Kahneman's work. You know, you're you're not going to be in system two if you're worried, if you're hungry, right, right. And you're tired and you're depleted. Um, that system is not going to be engaged. Um, and so it's really important, I think, to really, if you're going to be good at poker, and I think this goes to anything in life, you need to take care of your body. You need to actually treat it as a sport. You need to realize that sleep matters, that food matters, that what you're eating matters, how you exercise matters. All of these things matter. Yeah, I write much clearer in the afternoon when I've had a good long workout in the morning. Um, and when I don't work out, I, I find my mind is not as clear Mm -hmm. But of course, you got to eat in between there. I, I was amazed reading your book, the, the length of these tournaments. Like we started at 10 in the morning and, yeah. and at midnight, I'm still going like, holy <laughs> crap, when does she pee and eat? And so, so they take breaks apparently yeah. periodically. Yeah, there are breaks every few levels. Um, and sometimes you get a dinner break. 
um, that's usually like 45 minutes. So you don't actually have much time to do anything, but you get very good at snacking. So, <laughs> and what is your diet like? Just since diets are all the rage and you mentioned keto for some of these <laughs> poker players or vegan, some people, yeah. you know, the, the, all the rage now is to fast from between dinner and, and noon the next yeah. day. So if you can go like 14, 16 hours, this is supposed to be good for weight loss. I'm not so sure, sure it's good for <laughs> clarity, mental clarity. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Um, and yes, I, I usually fast when I sleep. Um, that's my <laughs> fasting window. <laughs> so good eight so hours, it, no eating. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I have a nice window of fasting at night. Um, but my diet is, um, you know, I, I tend to be pretty healthy. I'm an omnivore. I eat everything. Um, but I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And as far as meat goes, it's mostly fish. Um, and when I can, it's a lot of sushi. That's mm -hmm. When I'm traveling, that's actually the main thing I eat because I cook normally. I cook all my own food at home. Um, and so it's really hard when you're traveling um, to stay healthy and to be eating in restaurants I mean, all the you time. You were on the road a lot. I was amazed. I had yeah. rented an apartment in Vegas for the summer. It's like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, um, you have a patient husband. <laughs> I, I have, I have, uh, I have a saint of a husband. But, yeah. uh, but also a lot of travel. I mean, I mentioned Monte Carlo at the beginning, but yeah, Monte Carlo. How cool is that? Yeah, um, all over the world. Monte Carlo was really cool. Macau was less cool, but I'm mm. glad I went. Um, you know, I, I went all over the world. Actually, in 2018, I spent about eight months of the year traveling. That's mm. a lot. And so you have to be really conscious of what you're eating. And so I just try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and when I'm playing, no carbs. So no pasta meals, no pizzas, nothing like that. Because, because of the sugar rush? Or yeah, the, it makes yeah. You, it makes you it makes you sluggish afterwards. You need right. to kind of keep it clean. Um, protein. so a lot of salads, a lot of protein, a lot of fish. Yeah. 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 Um, and did, you must've taken good notes while you were I did. on the road because the details you have and, you know, I had this card and he had these cards and yeah, yeah. I, I, I wrote down almost every hand I played. Um, I took copious notes the whole time. Um, and I, not just notes of playing, but what was going on at the tables, because I knew I was writing about this. And, you know, as a, I'm a journalist who's been doing this for a while, and I know that you can't rely on your memory. You're right. going to forget right. um, and if you don't write things down. And so I got into the habit of just constantly writing down everything, conversations, you know, I would take pictures of everything um, so that I wouldn't forget what a hotel room looked like. I wouldn't forget what a person looked like. I wouldn't forget what the table looked like. And that mm. brings back so many different things. Um, and so I have just notebooks and notebooks of, filled with notes um, about both cards and also atmosphere and how I was feeling. Because it's also, it was very important to me as I wrote the book um, to not have it be from the perspective of my current self, mm. to be able to recreate um, with as much accuracy and faith as I could the how I was really feeling and what I was going through at that moment. And the only way to do it is to write it down in the moment, because otherwise you're going to superimpose the you right now. Yeah. Onto the you oh, I love that theme in the book, the current me and the future me. I, I forget <laughs> it was, if it was your book or somewhere else yeah. about the Homer Simpson uh, line about, you know, he's, he's debating whether he should eat the donut or not. And he says, oh, that's future Homer's problem. I'm going to eat that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, I love that. Yes, I love that. Some Even supplies. Walter Michelle, I think you mentioned he couldn't have chocolate in the house because yeah. he, he he knew future Walter is going to eat that. I'm yep. the same way. If I have, uh, I always have a craving for chocolate chip cookies, like between six thirty and eight thirty at night. So it, if I have them in the house, I know future Mike is going to eat <laughs> the cookies. But if I don't have them in there, in a way, I'm I'm kind of there's too me or there's multiple us, multiple selves. And as you know, that's a debate in cognitive psychology is the, the is. is the self an illusion? There is no self, really. It's <laughs> maybe multiple selves, selves or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Which is a weird idea because you feel like a self. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yes, you have to you have to account for future Maria <laughs> in order in order to make uh, better decisions as present Maria. So, so you, I, got, you, you got to the finals, uh, a few of these tournaments that must have yep. been really exciting it was, you and it was. And, you know, I think the fact that I was able to actually capture a major title um, was crucial um, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, no one cares about the second place finisher. Right, it's right. Just, it's just the way it is. That's not a good story. 
Um, and I never knew, you know, it, it didn't matter for the book in the sense that the book was going to be what it was going to be. It's not like I said, I'm going to become a poker champion. You know, I said, I'm going to tell you this story and I'm, right. I'm going to go on this journey. It just would have been a different book and a different journey because had I not won, um, I wouldn't have gotten the attention of the poker world. I wouldn't have gotten a sponsorship. I wouldn't have gone pro. I wouldn't have started traveling all over the world. All of those things wouldn't have happened. Right. Um, and so it would have been a very different book. Um, and in order to win, you know, I had to get lucky. Sure, I had to play well, but I got lucky as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very important to remember. Yeah, the difference between first place and second place in any sport. You know, you you watch the NBA Finals, they go down to seven games, and the seventh game goes into overtime, and, you know, there's a one-point difference at, as the as the clock ends and the, and the ball goes in, and the one team is declared the world champions, and the other ones are the losers, or first, first losers. Yeah. It's like, yep. but there's really no difference between the yeah. two. Yep. Yep. But the, the winners are remembered. Yep. And so that, you know, talk about luck, like the fact that I was able to capture one title because I, you know, I'd won some smaller things. And after that, I had some big results. I came, I had multiple final tables. I came mm. in second a few times. No one cared about those though, right. because I, I didn't win any more titles. Right. It's really funny. So what's next on your adventures? Who knows? Who knows? You're, you know, you're one a full of the time, things you're a full-time writer, right? I am. Yes. Um, so who knows, you know, it's, uh, what poker has taught me is you really don't know what card is coming next. <laughs> so I'm just taking it. I'm just taking it one, one day at a time. Um, you know, it's a crazy time to be releasing a book. So well, we'll see. I know. <laughs> um, yes. and so we'll see what happens. Um, I, right now I'm just focused on doing everything I can to support the book. Um, and to work on the release and then we'll see, we'll see, uh, what tomorrow brings. And your dedication to, uh, Walter, you, in memory of Walter Michelle, I still haven't published my dissertation as I promised you I would, but at least there is this. Well, uh, to me, uh, who cares about a dissertation? I mean, who's going to read it? You know, 12 <laughs> people true. or something and, or even published uh, peer reviewed journal articles in prestigious yeah. journals. I mean, how many people read a couple hundred, you know, yeah. here, I think what you're doing and of course I admire it because it's kind of what I do is, you know, it, it, what, what John Brockman calls a third culture, you know, you have the kind of the, the, the artists and, and, and the humanists, and then you have the technical scientists and then, you know, there's something in between, you know, and, it's, mm -hmm. and I, I don't like popular science writing as a phrase because it, it implies that, well, I'm just dumbing down for the masses what the pros are doing, and right. I'm not really adding anything to it. No, no, that's not at all what uh, you're doing in this book, for example. I mean, you're adding knowledge and insight about psychological principles uh, around this particular structure, poker, uh, and bringing in, in you know new insights that no one else has thought of. Well, thank you. And that's I, I, original to me. That's an, that's <laughs> an equally important, if not more important, contribution to human knowledge. I think. Well, thank you. That that makes me that makes me very happy to hear you say that. Now, if only your book sales will match what I just said, that'd be good. <laughs> that, then I then I will be golden. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough time to have a book when all bookstores are closed. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> but could be worse. <laughs> So, uh, well, as you know, I'm a, I'm a fan, Maria, so I, I'm, I loved reading your book, and I can't wait to read uh, the next one. Uh, where Thanks. can people find you online? Um, I'm mostly on uh, Twitter as M. Konnikova and Instagram as Girl Named Maria, but Girl doesn't have an I in it. It's just GRL. Oh, okay. Girl, girl with an I was already taken. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I took, I took the next best thing. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and I'm, I'm not on Facebook very much. Yeah. So, so th those two are the, are the way that I mostly communicate with the world. The previous book was the confidence game. And what was the, the other one about Sherlock Holmes called? Mastermind. 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 That's right. Yeah. So yeah. I recommend people uh, check those out as well, but especially the new book again, the biggest bluff, how I learned to pay attention, master myself and win. I got a lot of personal insights out of this. So will you, uh, who should read this book? Maria, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, congratulations on the book and, and thank you for your work. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure as always.